what's different this time? If we have a burgeoning debt, and we all know a burgeoning deficit, what's different this time versus one, two, three eras back to Ronald Reagan? Just much, much bigger. The, the deficit now, this coming year, will be about a trillion dollars, single year, trillion dollars. And that means that the debt is going to reach almost 100 percent of GDP by the end of the decade. What does it do to the reaction functions? If you're doing Newtonian physics at Harvard and you're talking about inertial force of mass, we all agree the mass of debt is frightening. What does that do to the, the guesses of the functions forward 10 years out? The amazing thing is it doesn't seem to do much. The, the market should be pushing up long-term interest rates. Instead, as you know, they're down a little bit from where they were six months ago. But I think that's just temporary. At some point, the market is going to say, who's going to buy all this stuff? You know, in the past, Professor the answer to that question was, the rest of the world will buy half of it. But that's yeah. not happening L now. Let me bring in my colleague in London, Guy Johnson. Guy? Professor, good morning. Good morning. Does the, does the level of U.S. debt have any impact on the cyclicality of the U.S. economy? Uh, if it does, it should be working through the interest rate. That is, l large debt should be pushing up uh, long-term interest rates, and that should be affecting investment and other things. Do you think that we are going to see, ultimately, the debt story changing the nature of the relationship the rest of the world has with the dollar? Well, in a sense, it's already happening. You know, Half of our debt has been held abroad. If you look at the last year, that has not been true. In the last year, uh, there has not been in any net buying by the rest of the world. Can you see a parsing between Republicans and Democrats? I mean, one of your charms a few years ago, I think Ronald Reagan, was you actually had a conversant discussion across the aisle on debt and deficit. I would suggest that's not happening now. And how do we get back to a conversation of the world of Martin Feldstein? There is no conversation now. There's just an attempt to ignore the debt and deficit. And I think we're waiting for the bond vigilantes. <laughs> okay, the bond vigilantes are going to come in. I would suggest the laureate Paul Krugman respectfully agrees with much of what you say, but disagrees with the urgency of the fear of higher interest rates. What does Professor Krugman get wrong? Well, so far, the market is on his side. The uh, long-term rates are not moving, but I think in time we'll see that happening. Gina, how does this, how does this translate into the equity market ultimately? If the U.S. is going to have 100 percent debt to GDP, uh, it theoretically, as, as the professor says, should drive up long-term rates, which then affects the discount rate that you apply back into the equity markets. Is there any evidence for that being, uh, that being the case at this point? Well, not yet. As Professor Feldstein has mentioned, rates haven't gone higher yet. So I think if we do go into a situation in which rates move significantly higher, you have a number of things that happen in the equity market. Uh, valuations are certainly impacted because your base for equity valuations is, of course, the long term or even the short term interest rate. If those rates are higher, you have more suppression and valuation potential. You also have an environment where utilization of debt for 30 years, companies <coughs> have been not only utilizing debt because of the rates are going down, but they've also been incentivized to utilize debt through the tax right. code. We started to disincentivize through the tax code with the tax package passed in 2017. If rates continue to go higher, then companies <clears> will have a much right. tougher choice between utilizing equity and utilizing debt. That utilization of debt has really benefited the equity investor because there's less supply of equity in the market, naturally. But if you have to consider how to fund your capital structure and utilize equity more often because the cost of debt is higher, it changes that dynamics and it's pretty significant. And Gina, you know the lecture that, that was in Act 10 at Harvard years ago. <laughs> It was a November lecture of Professor Feldstein. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Let's go to the chart here and look at the acceleration of the free lunch uh, right now. The deficit to GDP back a zillion years. Here's the Reagan years when it was terrible. It was all Feldstein's fault. Here's the Clinton surplus. <laughs> Feldstein had nothing to do with that whatsoever. And I'm sorry, Marty, we're rolling over with a second derivative that's increasing right now. Do you blame that on the Tax Act? that we saw over the last 18 months? No, I blame it. The real problem is the long-term deficit, and that is the entitlements. Uh, there's nothing that we can do 
with uh, the discretionary spending, it really is a question, do we tackle... Why can't we get back to 1986 and do something like grown-ups? 1983 was when we tackled Social Security and said we have to postpone the age for full benefits by mm. a couple of years. And since 1983, life expectancy for people in their mid-60s has gone up by three years. Yes. Seems to me it follows that we ought to raise that uh, uh, age for full benefits by another three years.